for digging me a hole right off the bat. <laughs> all right, looks like we're all set. So what I'm going to be looking at is synoptic climatology of deep slab avalanches at Bridger Bowl. Um, and like Alex said, just said, I'm working at, on a master's degree at MSU with Yordi and Carl and uh, another lady named Megan Higgs, who's a statistician. Although I should say it's not really fair to drag uh, Carl and Megan under the bus with me just yet because they haven't seen a whole lot of this. So <laughs> <laughs> we won't, won't place any blame on them yet. So just to start with a kind of clear up what is synoptic climatology. So all this is this means is that we're going to look at what's going on in the upper atmosphere and try to relate that to what we see happening on the surface. Um, and this is, here's a quote from a guy named Brent Yarnall who's done a lot of work in the field and I'm kind of basing a lot of what I'm doing at least for the first half of this on what he's already done. And I think this sums it up pretty nicely. So all we're doing is we're, we're looking at maps. This is a, well, I'll kind of tear this apart in a minute, but that's just a, a 500 millibar height map. It's showing what's happening way above, way overhead and we're trying to relate that to what we see here on the ground. Um, and this kind of thing has been done a bunch of times before. People have used it as a proxy for weather forecasts, uh, estimate snowfall, try to predict different kinds of avalanches, uh, snow structure, and then as well as outside of the field of snow and avalanches, uh, we look at drought, acid rain events, air quality. So it's not, I'm not reinventing the wheel here by any means. I'm, I'm just taking kind of what's already been done and trying to focus it right here, starting at Bridger Bowl and looking at deep slab avalanches. Um, and when, I'm, when I talk about deep slabs, we're looking at events where the slab is deeper than three feet and filling on a persistent weak layer. That, so <clears throat> problems that we kind of deal with all season that maybe we don't see a big event till right at the end of the year. Um, and the problem here, kind of like Ben was pointing out, the thicker the slab gets, the harder it is to trigger. So it's going to have inherently a low probability of occurrence. <coughs> and when we're trying to predict events, we're trying to estimate the probability of occurrence. So it's just by definition, it makes it difficult to predict. But, and also by their nature, it's going to be a significant event if we see anything like this happen. So, you know, you picture a slab that's at least three feet deep. That's the kind of thing that's going to be taking out old growth trees and breaking down buildings and will most likely kill you if you're involved in it. So kind of just a brief overview, uh, look at deep slab avalanches. So sort of seasonally what we expect the setup to be is we'll see some little bit of snow early in the season um, followed by a cold period where we can set up a temperature gradient. We have a cold, lot colder air sitting above the snow relative to the warmer ground. We start getting some uh, vapor movement in the snowpack and creating weak, a weak layer. It's just going to turn our snow to junk and we don't get any snow on top of it. Add a couple more storms and we're building a slab. Maybe we stop seeing avalanche events and maybe we add snow incrementally so it's not, none of it really fails and we're just building a stronger and stronger slab. Then possibly we could see a warming event, which is going to kind of relate to the case study I'm going to look at. And then you apply a big enough load or find the right spot and you end up with something like this, where you get uh, a major event with some significant destruction. So this picture was taken uh, from the wet slab cycle at Bridger Bowl in March of 2012 which is, I kind of picked this year as a case study because Alex had already looked at it, so it's well documented, and I can kind of use it as a starting point 
to see if what I'm doing is even going to make any sense. And we'll, I'll dive into that more towards the end of this. So the way I'm going to approach this is we'll, I'm going to take a look, a look at a real long record of 500 millibar height maps, which I'll, I'll highlight here on the next slide. Um, and then we're going to classify them into different groups. So we'll basically start with over 6,000 days and boil it all down to 20 different maps that we can work with so we're not dealing with such a huge data set. And then I'll determine the kind of weather, the typical weather you observe for each pattern, each map pattern. And then, so, and that's going to include temperature and precipitation. Hope, ideally I'll get wind in there at some point, but I haven't been able to find that record and maybe it doesn't exist. So that's, sort of, that's something I'm still working on. And then once you can kind of characterize each one of these flows, then it makes sense to look at relationships between the currents of each synoptic class and deep slab avalanche cycle. So ideally, you'd be able to target uh, either a single uh, circulation event or maybe a sequence of a few of them, where you go, you approach a time of year where all of a sudden uh, this sort of hidden beast becomes possible to trigger. So that's kind of what I'm getting at. So we're looking at 500 millibar height maps. Uh, what the heck are these things? So they're going to, they, this is sort of what's going on way above us. And it kind of it drives the surface weather we see. So it's, this isn't necessarily going to incorporate any of like the micro scale or graphics like what Gabrielle's talking about. Although, as she pointed out, depending on the direction that the storm is approaching, it will have an effect. And so it is possible to draw some connections there. Um, these map, the, the 500 millibar height occurs uh, just below uh, 20,000 feet usually, between five and 6,000 meters, um, which makes it another handy tool for looking at a study like this because eventually I'd like to take this approach and apply it to the entire Western US. And so you can look at regional scale circulations and they're still relevant because you can kind of neglect some of the surface effects of the roughness of the earth. Um, and what we're, we look at on here are a few different things I'll kind of reference throughout the talk. So here's a, a map, it's an observation map that I pulled off of NOAA yesterday. Um, and what we see, what I'm most interested in are these the isobars here, which is, it, you kind of can kind of read this like a topo map. So this is just showing the height in the atmosphere at which the atmospheric pressure is 500 millibars. That's not as important to know as some of the features here. So what we're going to look at are areas where you see these, these isobars dip down to the south. The, we call that a trough, typically associated with colder air masses because it's, it's, this area is moving down from the north. And also, uh, you generally see areas of uplift on the downstream side here. So you can kind of estimate that you'll see some precipitation in these areas. Contrast that with uh, what we call a ridge, and you'll see typically warmer, drier conditions here. And then one other thing that's pretty easy to pull off of these is uh, air, the direction and relative magnitude of, of wind speeds. Up, this is upper level wind speeds. So they're, they're gonna, wind is typically gonna flow parallel to these uh, isobars. And the, in general, the tighter their space, the faster that wind is going to be moving. So up here, we'll have stronger winds than maybe down here where the, or in the southeast where the isobars are spaced out a little bit further. And this is handy. We can relate. So you know, we can relate all this to snow and avalanches. And as I pointed out earlier, it's kind of already been done. But we can look at patterns that are going to set up in early season where we're either going to see, a, you know, is it going to be cold and dry or are we going to get some consistent snows? Are we going to have a warm uh, November like we did this year and have a generally stable snowpack? Um, look at late season loading events, warming, rain on snow, where we typically see the stability just drop and get kind of dangerous situations. And it basically you can kind of wrap it all up and hopefully when all said and done, we have another, just kind of another tool in our belt that we can use to try to predict when these events are going to happen. So, classifying these map patterns, um, 
This is a, a data set that's available uh, through the uh, NCEP, NCAR reanalysis. It's been used for a bunch of different studies, but it goes back, the data I'm using goes back to um, 1979, and I've, I've ran the data through the most, the last time I downloaded it, it was through uh, New Year's Eve, so December 31st, 2017. You start with 6,000 days of data and then try to group them together, so you say, Basically, all if each one of these rectangles represents a day, we're saying, all right, these green days are all more or less the same. The, the orange or peach days here are about the same, and the blue days are the same. And then we can create composites with those days by, by just, you just take all these and average the, the, uh, each grid point measurement and build a map like that. So. But each, this, these are the 20 classes I came up with, and each one of them is just a summary class that represents a certain amount of days out of the data set. It ranges anywhere from like 150 days to the less frequent ones to just under 400 for the more frequent. We take these map patterns and we can look at the, the weather that we typically observe. So this map, we show each bar represents one of these groups from the previous slide. And then, and the height of the bar is, for this graph, shows the frequency of storm events. So what I'm saying, basically, is uh, for this K1 class, about half the time we observe it, we'll see some sort of precept. Precept. You just divide the number of storm days by the total number of days. And then I've got it color-coded for the magnitude of the event. So the light green is about as a trace. This is a hundredth of an inch of water. And then the the, the dark green and the pink are a half inch to an inch of water, and this is over a 24-hour period. Um, I should point out these, uh, the, the record I was looking at, I only looked for the operational season for Bridgeable, November through April. So it takes out the seasonal signal from the data because we do see like an average winter setup and an average summer setup. So this, I'm, I'm zooming in on the, the winter circulations only. When we look at it closer, we see there's, a, there's this group of classes all represent days when we see a higher frequency of storm events. And uh, some of the main signals that we see is that a bridgeable is either downstream from a trough, where generally we'll see uplift, or with uh, most of the other groups, we'll see some uh, northwest flow, which is also typical of big storm events of bridger. So, it's, this is encouraging because it's showing that the classification scheme makes sense with what sort of what we've already observed in the past. When you contrast that with the dry classes, we'll typically see a ridge over Montana here, which is going to bring about generally warmer but also uh, drier conditions. Um, that ridge will, is usually going to show an area where you're going to see sinking air and little precip. We're going to end up with ski conditions that look something like that. And then we do the same thing with temperature. So much like the precip, seeing warm and dry classes with the temp, we'll see, I've got a line here at the freezing point. We'll see some classes where the average daily maximum temperature is above freezing, others where it's generally going to be much colder. Um, and this, this same pattern holds throughout the year, so you know, this class uh, what is that? That K8 is, is going to be the warmest, whether you're looking at the first half of the year or the second half of the year. But uh, generally, all these are going to be a little bit colder November through January than they are February through March, or February through the first week of April. The warm classes, uh, not surprisingly, we see again, uh, this, is, this is just one of the seven, um, but they all, this kind of tip is the typical pattern. They all are something like this, where you'll see a, a ridge which represents warmer than average air over Montana. Um, and because of that, they're also typically going to be drier. So here, this is, this is if you just sort of take one of the bars from that first precip graph, 
we see that for this class we see we observe precipitation around about one percent of the time we'll get a trace and barely anything else above that um, on the bottom right this is the average daily temperature um, that dotted green line if you can see it represents freezing point so you'll see more than half these days your average temperature so this is averaging between the max and the min is above freezing so these are this is typical of the warm classes compare that with the cold classes we see a lot of the same patterns we see with the storm classes where we'll have a, a well-defined trough over Montana um, air moving out of the north <coughs> sometimes we can see more zonal flow which means stronger east to west patterns but even with those zonal patterns are typically coming from northwest to southeast whereas in the warm classes they'd be coming either due west or from the south um, we see much uh, a lot of meridional flow which is kind of what this is showing where you have a lot of it's rather than the air most of the air moving east west it's moving north south and they're usually associated with precipitation so this is the k13 and we have the same graphs as we had before from K8 and you'll notice much more cold days and a lot higher frequency of precipitation events. That's when we're going to see skiing something a little bit more like that. That's what we want. So now you take all this and apply it to that this 2011-12 wet slab cycle and I've kind of done this just as a uh, sort of reference point to say all right I've got these maps they seem to make sense let's put them under the lens of deep slab cycle and see if there's any relevance at all in doing this any further and it seems like there is so just to recap on the season history here focusing first on the first part of the season uh, this year it was extremely dry so what we're looking at in this graph I can take that box off so uh, the gray bars on top represent total snowfall for each storm event. The black bars represent SWE. Uh, we have daily max temperature in the red, daily min in the blue. Um, we have our total snow depth for the season in the black line here. And then avalanche events are represented by bars at the bottom. And this purple line is the 30 year average snow depth at Bridger Bowl. All this data is from the uh, Alpine station at Bridger. Um, so looking at the first part of the year here, what we see is for no November, December, January, which this is taken from, uh, from the ISSW that Alex and some other people in this room presented in 2012. So we'll, s we'll see a lot low below average uh, snowfall and we also see the temperatures were near or even slightly above average for that November, December, January period. But since we live in Montana, near average is cold. So it was cold enough to still form the weak layer here early in the season. And that stuck around all year. You can see uh, right around New Year's, there's a storm event that was associated with some avalanche activity. Although this is more of what we call a direct action event, so it's not that's a little bit easier to predict if you, you know, if you dump a bunch of snow on top of an unstable snowpack, it's kind of fair to assume you're going to see avalanches. What made it difficult was this next period where we started getting a lot more snow and we didn't see as many avalanches. So you see our HS really pick up here in February. I think it was, we had between February and March, there's 168% of average snowfall. So the year started to turn around. Um, and then right at the very end here, we're going to zoom in on this, on a week at the end of March, we saw a pretty rapid warming event, um, and then which was followed by a wet slab cycle. And just to kind of to reflect on this wet slab cycle, what we saw is on the right around the 24th was when the snowpack went isothermal. Um, on the 26th, we started seeing avalanche activity in the region, not necessarily at Bridger Bowl. And then on the 27th was a major uh, storm or wet slab event at Bridger. 
And you look at the synoptic climatology here, so thinking back about the summer glasses, uh, what we see is for the first half of the year, there is a lack of storm class days. So the, the bars that I've highlighted in red here represent the classes that typically have a higher frequency of snowfall, and we, we didn't really see those as much, and including the 13, which we get are, is historically has more snow associated with it. We didn't see any days. We also saw a lack of warm, warm class days. Three of the groups were completely unrepresented, and then the four that were, were only had a couple days in that period. So this kind of explains, or is part of the reason why we had that generally dry and near average temperature period for the first half of the season. When you look at, the, at that week leading up to the event, um, what we saw with the snowpack was that first it goes isothermal and then with vertical flow channels were established in the slab which allowed water to move through downward through the snowpack without destroying the slab. So you still have a cohesive slab on top of that weak layer. But then once the, once the water moves through that slab, then it's gonna, the weak layer acts as a capillary boundary. So there's basically more pore space and the water can't flow into it. It's being held up still by the relatively more dense slab. At that point, the water starts flowing downslope and it kind of erodes the weak layer even further. So rather than applying a load to make this event happen, we just weaken the weak layer even more. Um, and then, and then by throwing a couple bombs on it, everything came falling down. What's interesting from the synoptic climatology point of view is that this week leading up to it, we watched six days, six consecutive days that are typically in the warmer, are, are associated with the, that warm group. So from the 22nd to the 27th, we, this, is, this is the sequence that happened more or less. But we're basically establishing this pronounced ridge with southwest flow over bridgeable right there. So if you could kind of go back in time and take a look at this, you know, it would be one indicator that you might be heading towards instability. Now I haven't fit any, this is not at all supported by statistics, it's just a case study, but it's still, I think, interesting enough to approach this even further and now look at a long-term record and see if we see common sequences like this where you have a few days of, sus of some sort of sustained circulation leading up to a big avalanche event. So uh, moving forward, I'm going to take a look at this, kind of use a similar approach to look at the, at the full record of uh, the Bridger data and try to put, try to quantify to see if there's any st statistically significant sequence of events that are, we see immediately prior to a deep slab cycle or in the early season that would form uh, weak layers. I'd like to try to add wind to the picture to, to look more at loading events because I think right now it's kind of a partial view. And then once I get this all worked out, the goal is to use this same approach for, with the West Wide Avalanche Network and look at other ski areas across the West and compare uh, different geographical regions and different snow climates. That's all I got.